So my name is Joel Smith, and I'll introduce myself a little more here in a second. But uh, today's talk is going to be about aquaberries and how we're going to be kind of doing some research on them here on the reservation, on the Playa Dini Reservation. So, aquaberry workshop, which is today. So before I get started, I just want to say a quick thank you. To, there's been a lot of people that have helped me so far along the way. Uh, CSKT Natural Resources. Uh, Roundtable Crown of the Continent for funding this today, or help funding this today, USGS, CSKT Climate Change Adaptation Committee, Salish Kootenai College, and CISNAR, which is uh, who provided the funding for me to work in Glacier last summer. So, my name is Joel Smith. I am from Bonnie Lake, Washington, originally. I was actually an electrician when I lived in Washington State from 1998 to 2011. Moved to Montana in 2011 from Seattle. I currently live in Ronan with my wife and daughter. They are actually both enrolled members of Salish Nation, but I'm a junior in the wildlife management program at Salish Kootenai College, and I will be graduating next spring with a bachelor degree. So, huckleberries, climate change, and bears. How are they connected, and why should we care? And how are bears and huckleberries related? You know, a lot of people want to talk about one or the other, but I'm just trying to touch on uh, bears also today. And by the way, if anybody wants to ask anything as we're going, it's okay to stop me. Any of you guys, not a problem at all. So we'll talk about how bears and huckleberries are related, and how we can learn more about these relationships so with huckleberries, climate change, and bears. So climate change in northwestern Montana, uh, increasing temperatures, there's been an almost a whole degree increase in the average or the annual mean temperature in Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho between 1961 and 2006. Might be a little higher now. That's in 2006, which you know everybody says you probably heard the same thing many times. Well, it's just one degree, and how does that matter? But one degree can really make a difference, and especially when the average temperature is likely to increase from between one and a half to three and a half degrees by 2050 or 2050. So you're talking three and a half degrees, and that's the average temperature. So you know, that can be a lot of variances of highs and lows too. Uh, warming greatest in the winter, spring, and summer. And so we wanna know how that's gonna change everything during those times. Uh, increasing maximum temperatures in winter are likely uh, to result in more rain versus snow. And so obviously we depend on snowpack in the mountains for lots of different things. I mean, not just our bears, but for drinking water and everything. So if we're gonna get more rain versus snow, it declines in snowpack and an earlier onset of spring and delayed onset of winter as was predicted to come. Overall precipitation is actually increasing, but warm season precipitation is decreasing. So we're thinking that a lot of times during the spring, during, uh, when huckleberries are expected to get their rain, that may change. But like it says, during the warm season, the precipitation should decrease. And then uh, increases in variability of weather and extreme weather events, like droughts and uh, rain on snow events that contribute to avalanche and floods. So, we all know about the common huckleberry, and hopefully we'll know a little more after today. It actually has quite a large range, uh, you know, throughout kind of the western part of the United States. Extending east to Ontario, Wyoming, South Dakota, and to Minnesota. And uh, huckleberries actually make up up to 15% of the bears' diets in Glacier National Park. And that was a finding done by uh, Kate Kendall, who worked in uh, Glacier National Park, and uh, kind of got the whole bear project going. Um, and it's a very important plant for indigenous people of Montana for several reasons, and obviously very important to, very important to bears, as I said. So the huckleberries have a large range, as I said, but we're just gonna focus on the huckleberries here on the reservation today. And here is a picture of some huckleberries that I just took recently, and I believe this one was, uh, this is either North Crow or Hell Roaring. I think this might've been the one over Hell Roaring. But uh, this is just a recent one from uh, here on the reservation, and they're starting to flower. It's actually a pretty good picture there. And uh, so yeah, mostly we're gonna talk about huckleberries today, but the very strong connection to grizzly bears, well, and black bears too, but we're gonna talk about grizzly bears a little bit here for a minute. It's listed as threatened in five populations in the contiguous US. It's a species of concern right here in Montana, which is why it's so important to know about climate change impacts on huckleberries. 
which is a major bear food. Bears are opportunistic and adaptable omnivores, and they have a very large vegetative component to their diet. And then again, that's why it's so important to know how the climate change will impact huckleberry production because the bears depend on them so much. As I said, 15% of their diet in Glacier. Uh, the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem population is doing well, a thousand bears and continues into Canada, but climate change effects are not yet fully understood and is a definite research need. And you know, the grizzly bear habitat, I should have put a picture of traditional where they used to be. The grizzly bears used to be found throughout a huge portion of the lower 48 and unfortunately they're just pushed up, but uh, they sounds like they're doing better. Uh, climate change and grizzlies. So there was a workshop about potential climate change impacts to bears and the authors of the workshop, Servine and Cross, and the point of this workshop was they identified several potential issues including, and this was, relates to climate change and grizzlies, so some of the potential issues they came up with was warmer, warmer autumn temperatures, delayed snowfall, earlier arrival of spring could result in later den entry and earlier den exit. So this is gonna be a lot of time where the, they may need to find food where typically they would be in their den. Now is that food gonna be there and how does climate change impact that? Complex changes to avalanche shoots, which may have bear foods, was another uh, topic they brought up at this workshop. And then although bears are adaptable omnivores, climate change impacts on bear foods are not yet fully understood, as I mentioned, and, and they also agreed at this workshop. So a little more on climate change and bear foods. Climate change impacts on bear foods is a research need, and those participants in that workshop I just mentioned were concerned with uh, the uh, in the increased chance of uh, human and bear conflicts if the, co if the climate change starts impacting the way huckleberries and other bear foods grow, if it has negative impacts, bears are gonna be out looking for more food. As we all know, they can get into things. And so uh, one of the things at this workshop was is if there's more human bear conflicts, and you know, that could be bad for bears. They call them troubled bears. And if it continues, they may eventually even have to be terminated, which obviously is what nobody wants. But if the food isn't there, they're just trying to find something to eat. And uh, so as Marcy knows, the huckleberry is in the Ericaceae family, which is a Latin word just for a family that it's in, kind of that's how they divide up different plants. And grizzly bears rely heavily on fruits from that family including huckleberries from mid-July and into the hyperphagic period in the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. And the hyperphagic period for grizzly bears is when they really start to put on a ton of their weight before they go into the den. And that's when they typically eat a ton of huckleberries. Uh, they, and obviously a high food intake is necessary to get all the fat that they need to go into the den. And uh, so that's why we're concerned. We wanna make sure those huckleberries are going to be there for them to continue eating before they go into the den. So a little more on climate change and bear foods. How will climate change impact bear foods, particularly berries? We want to know like about the berry production and how climate change will impact that. And there was two very relevant studies done that address this and I'll kind of touch just briefly on them. So the first one, Roberts et al, the results, ver uh, the variable predicted response, so basically what they think is going to happen with climate change and bear foods is some plants may actually increase in area even though uh, huckleberries are kind of known to have a low dispersal rate, they are actually expected to maybe increase in area with the climate change, but we still don't know about if they will be productive or not. The shrubs may be there, but will they have berries? And then I put this in here about the decreasing of area because uh, grass whortleberry is closely related to the huckleberry. They're both vaccinium, so they share the same genus. They're almost, you know, they're pretty closely related. So that is actually supposed to decrease in area while huckleberry is supposed to increase. And so, you know, that's another thing is we wanna know why. So a little bit of discussion about that study I just mentioned is uh, there are some things it doesn't consider. It does touch on some good things, but it doesn't consider productivity, as I mentioned. There may be the huckleberry shrubs there, but are they growing berries? And if they are not growing berries, we wanna know why. What, you know, what are the climatic things that are making them not be productive? And then it doesn't touch on low dispersal rates, as I mentioned. The establishment capacity of some bear foods, like huckleberries, are generally unable to grow domestically, as my friend Marcy here is gonna look into for her project for class. But, uh, there was a study in 2008 that found only 64 new huckleberry shrubs were present 24 years after Mount St. Helens erupted in bare soil areas. 
And so, you know, 24 years later, only 64 new shrubs. It's not a super high, you know, rate of them going out and growing in new areas. And then this also doesn't cover the introduction of new invasive food resources or competitors with food resources. So are things going to be moving in with climate change to where the huckleberries are and start to compete with them? Or if the huckleberry starts to move down in elevation, how is it going to compete with other shrubs or plants that are already there? Uh, and then elevation and distributional changes in food resources that would require, require bears to find those food sources. So if these different things like huckleberry or other bear foods have start moving up or down in elevation or start to slowly get eliminated altogether, the bear's gonna have to still find them wherever they are. And so that's another concern. And then complex interactions this, uh, such as fire and conifer encroachment, the study didn't really touch on that. You know, with fire, with uh, fire suppression, it gives way for more conifer trees to grow in, like this picture on the lower left, and just start crowding out. When you know, if typically before fire suppression, there would be more often low severity fires, and so that study didn't really touch on that too much. And that's an interesting thing that hopefully will get looked into. But uh, so a little more on climate change and bear foods. Another one of the studies I mentioned, they evaluated the influence of climatic variation on berry productivity using uh, productivity plot information. So they would just have different plots and they would see how the productivity was within those plots, how much berries were being grown there. And then climate data from snow tell sites, which some of you may have heard of. They're just different, I think, weather reading stations around, I believe. But uh, huckleberry yearly productivity is highest production during cool springs with high July daytime or di diurnal temperature ranges. So typically what the huckleberries did well was during cool springs, and then that's kind of expected to change here with climate changes. We're kind of expecting for the springs to get warmer and less precipitation. So a little more on grizzly bears food and climate change. Also with huckleberries making up 15% of bears diet in Glacier, will there be alternate sources of foods if huckleberry productivity does decrease? As I, as I mentioned, the shrubs may be there, but are they going to have berries? And if the answer is no, the berries aren't going to be there, then is there going to be something else there for the bears to eat? And that's kind of what that discussion group I mentioned said, is then could there be the potential for more bear and human conflicts? And hopefully not. And uh, increasing variability may lead to interactions of conditions that could impact berries. So if it gets really cold before a protective layer of snow covers the huckleberries, so I'll back up a second. Typically during the winter around here, you know, the huckleberries are up in elevation, usually above 3,000 feet. So during the winter, they typically have a good protective layer of snow that cover them during the winter time. And that's always been there. And that's the way we've always known it. So now with there being more rain rather than snow predicted, if it could just uh, you know, melt the snow away and then we don't know what's gonna happen. These shrubs are gonna be exposed to the elements all winter long and that's not typically what we're used to. So we're concerned with how are they going to react? Is that gonna impact berry production completely or will it not matter? I mean, that's one thing we're wondering. And then delayed snow cover and then shrubs may get damaged or destroyed just from being exposed to elements that typically they weren't exposed to during the winter time. So a lot of people ask me how I got started into this project. I was fortunate enough to get hired last summer as part of the CISNAR project, or uh, as kind of the CISNAR are the people that funds to get people from tribal colleges to go and do different internships and stuff. And so that's how I got hired last summer at USGS. And so I worked in Glacier last summer and that's what we did was monitored huckleberry shrubs up there. We had 10 different sites. And then so Huckleberry Bear Food Research monitoring to broadly ask about potential climate change impacts. And the components of the work we did in Glacier are kind of what we're emulating here. We want to kind of just do the same exact thing down here on the reservation as what I did up in Glacier. And we looked at productivity. Like I said, the berries, how many berries are being produced on these shrubs and what are the climatic uh, things that kind of drive that. And then the phenology, which is you know, the phenology of the huckleberry shrub is, is it starts, there's about, I think, six or seven different stages of the huckleberries. And um, so that's, uh, yeah, so phenology is there's like, it goes from flower or from bud to flower and then to a ripe berry. And so that's what we're looking at throughout the season and recording and then comparing that to uh, the temperature. But, and then we looked at pollinators, invasive pests, and fire severity we didn't look at last summer, but it is an interesting part that hopefully one day will get looked at. 
And then Kate Kendall is uh, the one that started the Bear Project in Glacier, but she also is the one that started monitoring huckleberry sites in um, Glacier around 1982. So she definitely deserves a lot of credit for getting this started. And then productivity, like I said, the shrubs, how many berries are on these shrubs, what influences high versus low productivity, and can this be predicted? So if there's, a, like, as her and I were talking last season, I think everybody noticed the huckleberries did really well. Even in Glacier, is one of the best years on record of, for how productive the shrubs were. And so that's what we want to know is what makes it like that. Well, last year, we had a cool spring with lots of precipitation, which fit perfectly into what huckleberries need. So we had a very productive year. And then what's going to make low productivity, and can this be predicted? And so that's kind of one of the things that's making us want to look at this. And then how much bear or people food is there under certain climatic scenarios, weather conditions in a year, and then other site-specific environmental variables. So site-specific being we're going to have 10 sites down here, just like we had, I think, 12 sites up in Glacier. So if one site's doing well and maybe a couple other ones aren't, what made that one site do well compared to the ones that didn't? And then uh, working on this question started by Kate Kendall in 1982. Uh, there was a report in 86, but uh, continued to collect data at some sites through 2011, and then last summer, and probably this summer too. So productivity sites in Glacier dating back to 1983. There was 54 sites monitored for four to eight years, four sites monitored 14 to 27 years. So it's always good to get data from several years to get more conclusive data. And then monitored 16 sites this year or last year, 2014. And that's what I did last summer working in Glacier was help monitor those 16 sites. And so, like I just said, last year was a very productive year for berries, and that's because of the late spring, quite wet, and it was a good benchmark and consistent with the Holden study findings, and that's one of those studies I kind of referenced a few minutes ago. And then this picture right here on the, I don't know if you guys can see or not, but there's a bear right here, a black bear. We have our different um, cameras. We have a camera set up at each location, and so one day I went there to look and check the uh, data. This is in Glacier last summer. I went there to check on our trail camera, and just uh, I think this one was just the day before that black bear had walked by. So that was kind of cool. Seems like uh, wherever the huckleberries are, you can sometimes find the bears too. But uh, didn't run into them, but still makes for a really good picture. And recording productivity metrics. So Tabitha is going to show you guys a tool we use. but. Productivity metrics recorded at the peak of the berry season. So whenever the berries are the most ripe is when we want to get our readings of them. And so we'll have a transect at each productivity site. So each site where we are going to where we have a trail camera, kind of close to that, we also have a 50-meter 50, uh, yeah, 50 plot. And um, we check the productivity along that. And what we do is we have that square frame. And I had another one somewhere I was going to use, but it, oh, right here. And so we have these transects for doing productivity at each of our sites that we already have or near those. And so what you do is you just hold it over a huckleberry shrub, like for this one example. And that's how um, you know people that want to get involved with this project can do the same thing. But you just hold it over, and then you just count every berry that's within there and what stage it's in. If it's tulip bulb, there's different phenological stages of the berries. And so that's how we count that. We put it over, and then you go one, two, and then on the third one, you record again. So that's what kind of gives us our random sampling. And that's the uh, method we used last summer in Glacier to determine that it was one of the best productive years. OK. And then the different phenological stages of huckleberries, just a fancy way of staying, you know, the growth of the berries throughout the season. And uh, did you want to show those pictures now or go over this? Just, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to go through each one of these using a, a series of pictures here. So I'm going to walk up to these pictures on the on the PowerPoint. But um, this is so this is one site up high at high elevation where uh, basically. Last year, as the snow was melting out, as soon as the shrubs became uncovered, they, the berries started to leaf out. And so you can see here, there's still actually three feet of snow right next to it, but that one shrub underneath the tree is already starting to leaf out. And then the next stage is um, the bud stage. And what those look like is they come off a little uh, pedestal here, and then they have 
the, this sort of uh, ovalish shape with the point on the end, and that's the closed flower bud, and that's what that looks like. In the same picture over here, there's an open flower bud, and you, it's a, it's, so it's an open flower, and you can, when you look at the end of it, instead of being a point, it has sort of little frills on it, and it has a, a separate little point coming out from the outside. And so those are, it's a picture of both flower buds and the open flowers. Here's a picture again of, a, of an open flower. So you can see it's kind of bulb, more bulbous and then it's got these little frills on the end. And then the next stage is the saucer stage. And so it looks a little bit like a, a thin disc. Um, and often the, the pistil, the reproductive part from the flower is still sticking out there. This is another picture of saucers. Um, and so you can see just looking at them from different angles. And we have some blown up pictures of these too, so you can look at them more closely later. Then it turns into a green um, tulip shape. So it continues to grow up from the bottom and it sort of has this tulip kind of a shape to the outline of it. And those continue to get a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger, like on this photo. Um, interest, it's interesting seeing just all the variation. So like this particular flower, this, this berry still has its flower parts that still are still attached. They just never fell off. And so sometimes when you look at them, you'll see things that are a little strange, but I think they actually happen a lot. A lot. Um, that's just another photo of the green ones, sort of from further back, so you can see how big they are relative to the plant size. And then and this is the, the, final, the final stages of, of where we get excited about it, but there's some round and green berries, so here and here. And then of course they start to turn pink and become red, and then they turn either reddish or more of a purplish black color like this, and that's where we like to pick them and eat them. There's just one other thing I wanted to point out about the stages of the huckleberry, and that is um, that sometimes there's a fungus that um, infects, the, uh, infects the berries. And so you'll sometimes see, and they're not always all like this on, on a single plant, but sometimes you'll see some of these white berries, um, we call them mummy berries, um, or ghost berries sometimes. But they're, um, those are really, they're kind of hard and inedible. Um, but that it seems to be pretty common and it doesn't kill the plant, it just affects some of the berries. Do you see that more in dry areas? You know, it's not well documented when it occurs and when it doesn't occur. Because that's what I, I've seen it in dry areas. More dry areas? Yeah. Yeah, it would be an interesting like hot springs. So you see oh, more of them out there. there. Yeah. yeah, it's an interesting hypothesis to test. So. So anyway, I just wanted to point out a couple of those now. Here, go ahead and explain that top one too, and then oh. I'll jump back in. Oh, so I mean, the main overall question that we were asking up in Glacier, and, and really what hopefully this data set down here will also contribute to, is just trying to understand um, along this phenological path, as you go from the leaf out all the way through to when the berries are ripe, what what happens? So if it doesn't become a lot of ripe berries, if it's not a year like last year when we had a, a really great year, um, what, what interrupts that? So is, it, is, it, is there a decrease from when it flowers to the next stage because they don't get pollinated? Uh, the flowers don't get pollinated. Is it a decrease because uh, it freezes and the flowers fall off or it's raining? Um, so we want to be able to try to tie this phenology to climatic uh, weather events to try to understand the mechanisms behind that. So, um, and we also have a bunch of methodological questions to try to answer the same. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So this is one of the pictures taken from the trail camera last summer in Glacier. And I just thought it was kind of cool to throw it on there. We also have our cameras at five of the locations I've set up so far on the reservation and I still have five to do, but yeah, it's always fun to walk by one and sometimes just say, get your picture taken. So to answer the questions that we're talking about this summer in Glacier, we use these methods. We had 147 visits to 12 different sites. Then as we're talking about record the phenophase, so the stages of the berries she talked about, we recorded them. So each visit to each site, 
we have 10 just randomly tagged shrubs and we want to count we have data sheets so you just count how many of each of those stages each shrub has and then you record the date and then we also have these things recording the temperature which are called data loggers so the last one on the list so it just kind of all ties together so we have one day where we would go there and then record the different stages of the berries, also the temperatures being read, and then also we know what day it is. So that's how we'll kind of, at the end of the project, kind of look at everything and tie it all together. But uh, yeah, record the phenophase, 10 shrubs per site, and then take as many pictures as we can. And just the more pictures, the better. And then I don't know if you guys noticed or not, but got an insect kind of flying around above that. It's kind of cool. And then yeah, each shrub has, uh, or as a rem or each site ha or one shrub has a remote camera. So one shrub at each of the sites has a remote camera and takes the pictures like that. And then data loggers is what reads the temperature. So we wanted to know a remote camera versus site visits. What is better? Is it better to have just a trail camera taking pictures of one shrub just several times a day throughout the whole season? Or is it better to actually have people going and taking the pictures themselves? And so right now we're doing both. That still hasn't been answered. Um, so that's something still to be determined. But remote cameras are a non-invasive way to get daily records of each shrub. And so, you know, nobody's gonna be in there possibly stepping on any shrubs or knocking any berries off, but it's limited to one view of the shrub. And then uh, it's a great tool for capturing exact length of time where individual flowers are in bloom, which is not published yet. Nobody really knows exactly how long. So that may be something we can answer. And it may fail if the camera's view has been obstructed or if the camera's been bumped. That same picture from a couple slides back where I was looking at my GPS unit, just a couple, or the day before this bear here knocked into that same camera, I would have been standing just right, <laughs> right behind that tree there. But so he bumped into it. So if we don't have anybody going out there and Mr. Bear here bumps into the camera, there's no way to know until somebody actually goes out and looks. So if somebody's going out there anyways, he might as well take some pictures. So using a remote camera to identify phenology. We're using a camera called a, uh, you know, there's one in there. There, I got it. Oh, there you got it. So these ones right here, it's called a Wingscape BirdCram Pro and it's got time lapse and uh, motion and they're pretty good trail cameras and they're the ones that we're using. Can take several pictures at program times during a 24 hour period. Uh, it helps visually record the phenology throughout the season. So we have one pointed and then there, here's just two examples of cameras that we set up. The one on the top is one I set up this season. The one on the bottom is one from Glacier last season. Um, so yeah, it just helps visually record the phenology of a shrub. But as I mentioned, it's limited to one view. Is it able to get an exact count? But getting an exact count isn't as important as seeing what stages the berries are in different times of the year. So even if the, if the count is a couple off, we still want to know what stages the berries are in. So knowing, being able to identify the correct stages is almost more important than an exact count. And then motion option, because you never know who's going to show up. I believe this is a hoary marmot, but hoary marmot, and that is from Glacier on one of our highest elevation sites. And I actually seen one of those when I was up there myself. Might have been him. But uh, so here's a remote camera from one of our sites we called GP2 for Granite Peak and Glacier. And then, so that's during the daytime, and that's also what we're exploring is, is it better to take pictures during the daytime? As you can see, it's fairly clear, but you, you know, if you're like me, you can kind of get distracted from all the different stuff behind it. So here's that same shrub seven hours later at nighttime. You can almost see the shrub more clearly than you can during the daytime. So that's another question we're trying to answer. It's actually a pretty clear picture right here. I was pretty surprised when I seen that. And then is one camera at a site enough? That's what we want to know. So we have the one camera at a site in a fixed position taking a picture of one shrub. And is that enough to really find out what we're wanting to know? Because how much variation in phenology within versus uh, between sites. So within the site means we might have these 10 huckleberry shrubs in one site. If we just have the trail camera taking a picture of one is what's going on with that one shrub the same as what's going on with all 10 of the shrubs. So we might be getting a good count of this one, but maybe it's having a better year or a worse year than the other ones. And so just having that one may not be a fair representation of that whole site. 
And then that's why we want 10 shrubs per site. And I think uh, we'll probably just end up having to take or wanting to take pictures of all 10 of them instead of just having the one. And I think probably the best method is going to just be continue using that one trail camera along with people taking pictures. And so if people want to get involved and help us with the project here, you know, you guys would be more than welcome to take pictures as well. And then uh, each shrub has an ID tag, as seen right there. It's just the best way to do it. And then we also have different ways of uh, marking that one shrub to find it because if you're out in the woods trying to look for a site and there's tons of growth going on, it can actually be kind of difficult to find the 10 you're looking for sometimes. But uh, we'll use phenology recorded at a site visits to quantify variation within versus across plots. So we'll find out how things are going. You know, is, it, is what's going on with one site that I got here on the reservation gonna be the same as what's going on with all 10? And then could citizen science work to document phenology? And we think, yes, it will work. And that's why we're here today to show you guys and people are more than welcome or anybody watching this is more than welcome to get involved too. And how some, we wanna know how similar are counts from the uh, pictures and the physical counts and can peak timing of flowering and ripeness be, te be te detected just as well. So uh, we'll record phenology throughout the season. You know, if you were to get involved, you could help do that. Record the phenology throughout the season. Take pictures of each tagged plant and then site pictures for extreme weather events. So like last year in Glacier, one of our higher elevation spots, I went up there to just run through the same protocol we always do. And if one of you guys was helping and got up there this year on the reservation later in the season and something like this was to happen, you would just take, if you can't actually I'll back up a second. We don't want to knock snow off of shrubs because that may knock berries off and it's a disturbance. So all we would ask is just take pictures of the shrubs with the snow and that was good enough. And so there's just another way, you know, showing that we tagged shrubs. And then, uh, so here's some simulated si citizen science photos. All three of these are from the same shrub and then that's its tag number from last summer. So that's typically what we'd ask you to do is just take a picture from a couple different sides of that shrub. First you take a picture of the tag and then a couple of the shrub, but uh, it does take time to count the berries in the picture. And so that's why, you know, you also count and we can record that on a data sheet. And that's what we did up in Glacier. And uh, would the quality of the photos be sufficient for some questions? And I think that they would be. I mean, anybody can take a picture. I know, I mean, I just started using a digital camera last summer working in Glacier. So I know that uh, I was able to pick it up. I think just probably most people are better at it than me and could probably get better pictures than I was even taking. And then, uh, you know, a handheld camera in my macro mode is the way I usually did it. Like this picture on the bottom right there of the individual berry, it was pretty clear. So it's always, uh, you know, you can usually get pretty clear pictures and I believe anybody wanting to help could do the same. I think anybody's data would be just as relevant as if I did it myself. And then here's a picture of the same shrub up in Glacier and we're kind of asking what would be better using a trail camera or handheld. And then this is the exact same shrub May be, it not, might not even be the same exact day, but it's just, you know, the same shrub kind of taken from the same position. And, uh, you know, do you think it could be counted the same way? And so there you go. But uh, temperature and, uh, or the data logger. So the way that we're, you know, the temperature is supposed to rise. And so obviously we want, we want to know about that. So we have these cool little things called data loggers and they record the temperature every 90 minutes, 24 hours a day. We put one at six feet high and then one at shrub height and usually facing north, but um, it's a good, oh yeah, it's a good explanatory variable for phenology. So if the phenology, you know, we're recording it along the year, it'll be good to be able to compare that side by side with the temperature from those same times. And that'll tell us, you know, if the berries did really well, then we'll have this temperature data to look at. If the berries did really bad, then we'll also have this temperature data to look at. So it'll be, you know, pretty interesting to compare those side by side after lots of data has been collected and see and then can be used to identify extreme temperature events and find out what temperature kills berry and what is either good or bad for productivity. And then pollinators, we, I think they started to look at this in Glacier last summer and I would love to, I, I don't expect that I will have time to do this on my senior thesis project, but this is something I would love to see get involved. Uh, we wanna know how complex is the pollinator community for huckleberries. And then, you know, everybody hears about the declining bee species of native bee species. And are any of those declining bee species the ones that do help uh, pollinate the huckleberries? And then when and how long do berries flower and does this relate to environmental characteristics? 
And we're wondering too, if uh, the climate change makes it to where the huckleberries start flowering earlier in the season or later in the season, the bees or whatever pollinators that would typically help pollinate those shrubs, are they gonna have a mismatch in timing? So that's kind of a concern there too. And then hand nets were used to uh, collect different pollinators. But that was uh, done before I got hired last summer. And then invasive pests. There's this little fly here called the spotted wing drosophila. And they're an invasive species, I believe, from Asia. And we want to know, are they present in huckleberry patches and glacier as well as here in the Mission Mountain area and on the Flathead Reservation? And if so, is it when the berries are ripe? And because um, see what these guys do is, is they're, they're a fruit fly, but they're not typical of other fruit flies in that these guys like um, ripe fruits rather than fruits that are getting old. So what they do is they, bear, they burrow into fresh fruits, lay their eggs, the larvae eat the inside of the fruit, causing the fruit to fall early. And so that's obviously not good. And so are they present here? If so, is it when the berries are ripe? And so typically cold springs are bad for spotted wing drosophila, but unfortunately the springs are supposed to get warmer. And so that's why we're concerned. If the springs get warmer, that may invite these guys to have more suitable habitat and come in and start attacking huckleberry shrubs and the berries because models only suggest that the temperatures will get warmer, which is favorable for spotted wing drosophila and maybe not favorable for huckleberries. But, uh, so what we did last summer in Glacier to monitor for them is we would have one fly trap at each of the 10 sites. And that's what this red container is in that picture right here, usually hang it up you know, about this high up, and that's this guy right here. And Tabitha actually got the design from this from a cherry farmer, and I'll get more into the cherry part of this here in a second. But you just hang this in the tree, we put about a half inch of this fluid in there that's an attractant, and we cut these holes small enough so only small insects get in there. And um, so last summer we collected these all summer long, and I ended up sorting through a ton of them, and I had one uh, fly that I believe was a spotted wing drosophila out of thousands of insects. But, uh, you know, early detection is better. If we start screening for these now, then it's better than finding out when it's too late or when they're attacking already. Early detection is better for making management decisions. And hopefully that, hopefully they never get up here. But so there were, the spotted wing drosophila, this is that fruit fly I was just talking about, they have a recorded presence in the Mission Valley and some Flathead Valley cherry orchards. And so some cherry farmers are having a problem with these guys. And as I said, they get into the fruit and they lay their eggs, the larvae hatch, eat the cherries, make them fall. And so that's why we're screening for them. We figured if they can get to the huckleberries, are they going to try to attack the huckleberries? And um, so yeah, they get attracted to the fresh berries, burrow inside, cause them to fall early. And then huckleberries identified as a major source of bear diet during autumn. So we're worried if these guys do get to the huckleberries, or you know, how much of an impact is that going to have on bear foods? And this relates to climate change because these guys couldn't really live where the huckleberries are if the climate stayed the same and the temperatures stayed where the springs are cool. But now with the climate warming, are these guys gonna have an opportunity to start attacking huckleberry shrubs? Hopefully not. And then uh, this would be a negative impact on food availability for bears, or would it? Because favorable conditions for berries have been bad for flies. But like I said, that could change with the climate warming. And then this map here is just showing the different areas where there was a presence. I think this was as of 2012. And that's just kind of, I think, the density of how many there are. So let's kind of transition here into kind of the local aspect of the huckleberry stuff. So fire, huckleberries, and Salish people. So talk about fire and climate change, huckleberries and fire ecology, fire suppression and fire severity and how that relates to huckleberries, bear food production and fire, and Salish people and how they used it, fire as a tool. So fire and climate change, I guess I can go over that more right now. So fire and climate change, um, there's only expected to be more wildfires as the climate gets warmer and they're supposed to be high severity fires. And so huckleberries and fire ecology, that's what we're kind of wondering. Typically huckleberries will do okay with low severity fires, 
but with fire suppression being the model for several years now that leaves more fuel on the ground and leads to more high severity fires because huckleberries are kind of adapted for low severity fires. Whatever uh, burns on the top part of the plant, they just re-sprout from the rhizomes underneath the ground. That's why sometimes you'll see a couple of huckleberries in a row. They're possibly sprouted out from the same rhizome, which is just kind of like a root that, rose, uh, that goes horizontal in the ground. And so with a low severity fire, it only burns the stuff above ground. But at a high severity fire, if it damages the rhizome, then they don't re-sprout. And um, that's obviously bad, as I mentioned, for bear food production. And then, you know, Salish people had used fire as a tool. They would uh, sometimes burn the huckleberry shrubs after harvesting because they knew that that was a good way to promote regrowth and keep other plants from moving in because the fire would burn off the new stuff that would move in. It would basically, they just set low severity fires, burn everything above ground. The huckleberries would move back or grow back and be quite healthy. So fire and climate change, the U.S. Forest Service estimates that annual acreage burned in Montana by wildfire will increase by five-fold by the end of the century. More high severity wildfires will put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which that's what everybody's concern is, is the CO2 being getting into the atmosphere and being a greenhouse gas, keeping heat in and not, you know, that doesn't let the heat escape back out of the atmosphere. So with more high severity fires, how much CO2 is going to be up there and how that will that change the temperatures? And doing research now is important for future generations to enjoy bears and huckleberries. And the reason I say that, that's my daughter right there. This is up in Glacier last year. I want her to be able to enjoy huckleberries and bears the way you know the elders around here did for a long time. And then huckleberries and fire ecology. The huckleberry foliage, foliage is of low flammability. So even though sometimes low severity fires may burn off most of the stuff above ground, some low severity fires, the leaves may not even burn at all if it's a really low severity fire, which allows for a high survival rate of huckleberry shrubs after the low severity fires. And then the shrubs that are exposed to low severity fires for a long time are better adapted for them and, um, and could adapt and survive them even better than uh, the fire suppressed areas. So the huckleberry shrubs and fire suppressed areas that haven't been exposed to the fires don't, you know, they're not adapted to it as compared to the ones that are in areas that have been burned, they have been adapted. So top killed plants re-sprout from the rhizomes, as I mentioned before, and shrubs only consumed by fire when other fuels are present. And so that's what this fire suppression has kind of led to is different uh, fuels being around on the ground. And so when those start burning up around the huckleberry, it creates a higher severity fire. So if fire reduces the invasion of other shrubs and trees, as I mentioned. If it's you know, constantly being burned after the season, that won't allow for other things to move in. And it's not even necessarily invasive shrubs. There could be native, like the, uh, you know, the pine trees around here. They could, you, know, you see small pine trees growing near a lot of huckleberries. And if there's low severity fires, those get burned out. And then there's not competition for the huckleberries right there. But uh, fires reduce the invasion of other shrubs. Large huckleberry patches in the Pacific Northwest are considered a product of pre-suppression wildfires. So the different native tribes of Washington and Idaho, Oregon, Montana, they would typically burn the huckleberry patches every few years. And there used to be just huge patches of huckleberries that you'd hear different elders talk about that they remember or that they know of that they've been told about. And that's you know, a product of them using fire as a tool. So fire suppression and severity. So fire suppression has been the model since the 1920s. The US Forest Service kind of implemented that because they thought that was the best way to do it. But as we know now, that's probably not the best way to go about it. Fire suppression has led to encroachment of conifer trees where berry patches were. So that's as I mentioned, you get these different ponderosa pines and different things growing there that could compete with the huckleberries. So after several years of suppression, high intensity fires could have really negative impacts on huckleberry regrowth. And that's kind of like I mentioned, the rhizomes of the huckleberries and the high severity fire get burned and they can't regrow and they already have a low disbursement. Huckleberries aren't really quick to move into an area. So if you're burned the ones we already have, that's just less already. And uh, how does fire severity influence length of time until berries are present? So if there's a fire and the huckleberries shrubs may be there after the fire, how long is it after the fire when the berries start to produce again? So the Robert fire, as many of you may have heard about, this was in Glacier in 2003, and it was a high severity fire. So there was at least one case where huckleberry shrubs were present before the fire, 
and after the fire, but after the fire, they still weren't producing the berries. And so as we're talking about a high severity fire, the huckleberry shrubs are there, but they're not producing berries. This is just one example. There wasn't really resources available to check to see if there's more, but we would suspect it would be the same way that a lot of these shrub, huckleberry shrubs are there after a high severity fire, but they're just not producing the berries for people or bears. So plots compared pre and post fire. And as I mentioned, it was just the one example. There just wasn't the resources there to do more, but you might expect that it would be the same way in a lot of those areas. <clears throat> so bear food production and fire. Extensive wildfires in Northern Rocky Mountains from 1989 to 1920 created vast areas of cereal communities dominated by shrubs. So, you know, like huckleberries, these fires would keep out the conifers and other trees from moving in, which allowed for these larger patches of shrubs like huckleberries. And these cereal forest communities maintained by fire are important for preferred berry producers like huckleberries. Many shrub communities, especially those at middle elevations, were identified as important producers of grizzly food in northwest Montana. Fire exclusion changes these middle elevation shrub patches, allowing other plants to colonize. So, as I mentioned, the uh, middle elevations were identified as for very important food producers for, huck or for bears, but fire exclusion changes the dynamics of these middle elevation areas, allowing other plants to move in and out, or, you know, sometimes outcompete the huckleberries altogether or just compete with them and they're still there where you would generally just want just the huckleberry shrubs. And then uh, most, grizzly bear weight gain, gain, uh, most grizzly bear weight gain occurs during summer and fall when they feed almost exclusively on berries. So there's a period where they eat a ton of huckleberries to get all of that sugar and fat. And that's why we're concerned with berry productivity, how we want to know what climatic vari or, you know, variables, what weather is making huckleberries either productive or non-productive, and we want to know because of when the uh, bears gain the most weight is when the huckleberries are typically doing well and being productive. So if this climate change changes that and the berries aren't there, you know, as I mentioned earlier, what are the bears going to eat, and is that going to make them go where people are? Uh, effective fire suppression has negative impact on bear habitat and food. So that's, you know, basically just covers what I said as keeping fire out makes other things move in and then you have a loss of bear food. Salish people, huckleberries and fire. Huckleberry is a very important uh, culturally for Salish and the Kootenai people. And they even would call the time when they would uh, harvest the huckleberries the huckleberry moon. And they would set fires for, the Salish people would set fires for various time, various reasons during different times of the year. And they used fires also just to keep their forest clean. It was aesthetically pleasing, you know, to go out into the forest and you could actually just see space between trees and everything was nice. You only had the big trees. And a lot of times now you go out here, it's obviously still nice to be out there, but there's not so much space in between the trees. You see a lot of the fuel on the ground and a lot of other smaller trees there. And so that's why they would try to burn some of that stuff out. They knew that by doing that, it would eliminate a lot of the fuel on the ground and that would lead way for less high severity fires. And, uh, and they knew that. <laughs> so they were probably surprised when they were told all of a sudden, hey, you can't use fire anymore, even though that's what they'd been doing for you know, a long time. Uh, Salish people would burn the huckleberry patches in autumn after berry picking was done. When shrubs got too tall for people, they would set fire under the huckleberry shrubs and then leave that patch alone for two years. And it was said after that two years, they would come back and it would just, they would just be really productive because <laughs> it would be a low severity fire and there wasn't all the fuel there to make it a high severity fire, which in turn has good berry production for the Salish people and the bears. And after a burn patch recovered, you know, it was very productive. And uh, so the Salish people and the Kootenai people are great land managers with proven successful models. They were doing this for a long time. So when outsiders would come in and tell them, hey, you can't do this anymore, you know, they knew it was the right way. And obviously they were right because during the, the times when they were allowed to burn, that's when the huckleberries were most successful. A little more on Salish people, huckleberries and fires. They stopped using prescribed burns when the U.S. government sent agents to break the Salish people of their traditional ways. And uh, using prescribed, but now today the Salish people and Kootenai people are using prescribed burns again with approved prescribed burn plans. 
and how will controlled burns fit into a world trying to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. I'm, you know, I had that question because I was kind of asking myself, but then you also need to remember that low severity fires are going to actually produce less CO2 than high severity fires. So I think you know, using prescribed burns fits in nicely in a world trying to lower its CO2 emissions because if you're doing low severity fires, there's less CO2, you get high severity fires, it's more CO2. And you know, I would think it would be a huge honor to be the ones to set the fire, either back then or for today. The tribal way of life is what's good for the tribe is what's good for me, not what's good for me is what's good for the tribe. So going and burning a patch that, you know, that person knows two years later, that's going to feed a lot of their own people. And to me, that's a great thing. And then a little more and say there's people, huckleberries and fires. So today, I was reading, I mean, not today, but I was reading through the uh, CSKT climate change adaptation uh, book that they gave me and it kind of shows their plans and there was some interviews for some elders and there's a couple pages in there where some of the Salish elders were discussing how they remember a lot more huckleberries from when they were children and bigger patches and you know today I mean, I haven't personally seen a lot of huge patches of huckleberries. You get into some spots where you may find a few shrubs, but you read about some of the elders talking about these areas of just huge patches. And, you know, that is consistent with the results of some of the studies that I mentioned earlier that says that low severity fires it promotes good huckleberry growth and patches from keeping other things from moving in. So these elders talking about that, you know, people call it traditional ecological knowledge, but to them, that's just knowledge. I mean, I think traditional ecological knowledge is just a label that was given to what they knew and did, but their methods to them was just science, just like it is to us today. And they were just doing their proved scientific methods, which obviously were successful for huckleberry productivity. And so when you hear these elders talk about these large patches, excuse me, that were productive, it's probably a product of them being great land managers and using these low severity fires as a tool. So here's a couple interesting pictures. I got this off CSKT.org. It's a before and after picture. So 1920 is kind of the benchmark year that you hear about fire suppression being started by the US Forest Service or the USDA. And so, you know, they said, let's not use prescribed burns and let's actually fight burns when they happen. So here's a picture of 1920 in the Mission Mountains. And you see all these patches of areas that aren't dominated by conifer trees. Well, let's fast forward 75 years later and it's completely filled with conifer trees. And that kind of goes with what I was saying and along with what these elders were saying. They remember large patches of huckleberries, which if you look at this picture, you can say to yourself, well, yeah, look at all this room. And that's, you know, Janine Lichtenberg is my teacher here at Salish Kootenai College and also my advisor and I think the head of the wildlife department. When we were at one of the meetings at the Climate Change Adaptation Committee, she made a point that there's just kind of this strip along the Mission Mountains that is very favorable for huckleberry growth. And then you look at this picture and you say, well, yeah, that totally makes sense. So you can imagine these large patches in here and then 75 years later with fire being excluded and not being, you know, people not being able to use fire as a tool, that whole strip, yeah, the huckleberries are there today still. We all know that we've all gone there and eaten them ourselves, but there isn't that those large patches because of the conifer trees being allowed to move in. And then here's kind of another example of before and after fire suppression on the Flathead Reservation. I don't think this is the same exact area. This is just kind of an example of what does happen. So the picture of the left is, you know, early 1900s where fires were allowed to burn and even they were still burning, you know, the Salish people and Kootenai people were still allowed to burn. And then this is what happens if you don't. You know, you get all these smaller conifer trees moving in and other shrubs moving in. And, uh, Oh yeah, so the picture on the right is what's typically seen today. Small young trees crowd out the shrubs, huckleberry shrubs, uh, that bears and people depend on, which can also lead to insect and disease breakout. You hear a lot today about the bark beetle up here in the Mission Mountains. Well, you know, it's a huge problem. There's a lot of more trees. I mean, I'm, you know, I don't know for sure, but there's a lot more trees today and maybe that has something to do with it, but maybe it doesn't but it does lead to more insects and disease breakout by getting this overcrowding of trees. Just like you get more people together, more people are gonna get sick. And when the trees are like this on the left, you know, that's the more healthy trees are the ones that are gonna live and get big, which would, you know, they're more adapted and better suited to probably fight off disease and all these young ones moving in. 
So Sage people and bears, you know, I think they consider themselves equals with the bears and that's why there is no bear management plan or hunting bears on the reservation. Even before I think the bears were listed as a species of concern in Montana, I mean, today they wouldn't be allowed to probably because of that. But even before that, you know, Salish people typically don't hunt bears. They you know, see them more as an equal than as a food source. They typically don't eat bears and they typically don't hunt for them, except for medicine items and other things like that, but not for sport or not for food typically. And uh, you know, even here on the reservation, the tribe shuts down part every year for the bears to feed undisturbed before denning, like up in McDonald Lake, they eat those army cutworm moths. And so that's why they shut down that area to the public. And then uh, doing the same research on the Flathead Indian Reservation that Dr. Tabitha Graves, uh, the one that showed you the different stages of the berries in Glacier could help the tribe better understand impacts on huckleberries and bear habitat due to climate change. And, and that's what I'm kind of doing. That's why we're here today. And that's what I'm working on with my senior thesis. And we've also met with the CSKT Climate Change Adaptation Committee to kind of go through this too. So. Uh, so far, everything's been going pretty well, and the path to actually getting out into the field and doing this work has been pretty smooth. I'm pretty thankful for that. The tribe has been helping us tremendously. I feel like they're helping us more than we're helping them, and we're the ones trying to provide the data. Um, so expanding spatial data, the need to better understand how climate change is impacting huckleberries and bear habitat, mentioned by multiple peer-reviewed articles, you know, and I mentioned just a handful of them earlier. Uh, existing studies are a step in the right direction, but more needs to be done. It's not published yet how long huckleberries flower. Um, and every one of those guys mentioned that more needs to be known about how climate change is affecting or impacting bear foods like huckleberries. So the Flathead Reservation is 1.317 million acres. It's a great place to do this research because it's a place where we have huckleberries and grizzly bears. So everything is here. Uh, you know, to do the research and to ask and hopefully answer the questions that we want to do. And um, yeah, so it's a large piece of land that has huckleberries and bears. So it's a great place to continue the research that I started off in Glacier. And as I keep saying, everybody's welcome to help. So working with the tribe, I still need to meet with the Salish Culture Committee. Uh, they are aware of what we're doing, it's just timing. And we want to talk to them about the best way uh, to provide useful data on the huckleberries. You know, so still looking forward to that meeting. And then we want to develop a research and monitoring pro protocol that helps the tribe better understand huckleberries, bears, or you know, huckleberries and climate change because it is a bear food and a food that the people would depend on typically. And uh, make it simple enough so that anybody can monitor with minimal training. And that's kind of why we're here today, to show you guys how to do it because we want to get the citizen science aspect involved because. Uh, you know, it's, I, I don't feel like just because I'm doing this research, I'm the only one that can collect the data. You know, anybody can do it, and the data is going to be the same whether I do or you do. And uh, I just want to give something useful to the tribe. And the uh, tribe has a strong connection to bears and huckleberries, so it's very important to preserve for both uh, for tribal uh, generations to come and for everybody to do it. You know, that's going to be here. And some goals, uh, so this is my senior thesis and working on the reservation, some of my goals is conduct the same protocol that I kind of ran through earlier that we're doing in Glacier. And, but mostly to look at the phenology and the citizen science part of it. I want to get every, you know, everybody, whoever would like to help can help and then record the phenology as she mentioned the different stages of the berries. That's where you guys could come in and help is help record that and take pictures and check on our trail cameras. And then study plots on the reservation. I'm gonna have 10 all together. I only have five so far. And the goal is to visit uh, one, each site once a week and uh, to work with the public and you know who wants to help. Anybody's welcome to help. And the goal is to teach potential citizen science, some potential citizen scientists about the project and then how to install and monitor trail cameras and how to find the sites with GPS units. And then working on the reservations and goals is my senior thesis, either interviewing elders or going over interviews that were already done and to get some baseline data on the reservation about climate change and huckleberries and bear foods. And then the temporal questions like the flowering. And then uh, so reservation study plots, Janine kind of pointed me in the right direction and showed me the overall areas to go. And so far I've been kind of going off that. And then just thank you for your time. And so that concludes this part of it.